Welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. This week our focus is fixed on the novel coronavirus as volatility emerges across global markets. Converted cases have surged now to over 81,000 cases worldwide and has so far claimed over 2,700 lives and appeared in 48 countries that we know of. Markets have eventually reacted with sustained falls over the last week, triggering calls of potential recessions, severe supply disruptions and potential official global pandemic. Here to discuss how markets have now awoken in fright to the spectre of the coronavirus is our own Chief Strategist, David Llewellyn-Smith. G'day, David. G'day, Tim. And our Head of Investments, Damien Classen. Hello, Damien. Hi, Tim. And just a quick reminder that before we get started to subscribe on YouTube and click on the notification bell to be notified of when we go live or have a new webinar to watch and follow us on your preferred podcast platform. And for those, of course, listening in live today, feel free to drop in your questions in the chat box below along the way. So let's jump into it. So our agenda today, stats so far, we're gonna roll into, sorry, stats so far. We're then gonna be looking just lightly at some SARS comparisons. We'll then roll into some economic trade-offs uh, and we'll then be looking uh, locally into the Australian impact on both tourism, students, commodity, the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Australian dollar. And finally, as always, we will be wrapping up with the investment implications, what we're doing in the portfolios uh, in reaction to uh, and to looking forward into these uh, these themes that we're discussing today uh, across the bonds and commodities as well. So with no further ado, we'll roll into stats so far. Who to believe, gentlemen? Yeah, I've got a I've got a chart up here, um, or a couple of charts, just sort of showing the the Chinese cases. I just want to highlight that that China's changed its definition on on multiple occasions. We've sort of put on on these graphs. We've shown three of them. There's, there's actually been other ones as well that that, that they've changed. But I think the biggest change um, was one back in uh, on the seventh of February when they decided that anything that was uh, if you had the disease but it was only relatively mild, you wouldn't get counted as a case. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so that obviously affects these numbers quite quite significantly. We've got these charts where we've we've shown what what it would mean if you just sort of extrapolated the number of um, cases, which we're assuming will be severe cases, relatively severe cases, and then said, well, what what would that actually mean for the actual case count? Mm -hmm. uh, and we've also sh shown some of the um, some of the suspected cases, and just showing that those those numbers are much higher, a factor of you know. I don't know, five, six times higher at least. Um, we're, we're not a, we're not entirely certain. Well, actually, we're we're, we're pretty certain that the numbers that are being reported aren't high enough as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, with all the different um, with all the different changes that are going on, some of them are probably genuine, but there is a lot of from day to day. There's a lot of oh, you know, numbers from yesterday we've, we've misreported, we've changed these ones, and they're back and forth. And it's almost as if you're playing a bit of a game of just keep shuffling the numbers around and hoping hoping that people will give up on 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 trying to follow it and just just accept whatever you tell them wow. is, yep. is the right number. Epoch Times had some leaked documents from Shenyang, I think, this morning. Oh um, right, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, on. Uh, uh, actual from from the local CDC mm. uh, uh, tabulating the actual numbers versus the announced numbers right and they were somewhere between 25 and 50 times higher than reported right they were, they were reporting two or three and yeah, the yeah. real numbers were 50 and 100 right <laughs> wow and, and I know there's another there's a couple of um, mathematicians out there who have done some quite quite good analysis of the numbers and just saying uh, about how the numbers reported from China um, are on a, a quadratic function whereas every other disease we've ever seen has been on a logarithmic and, and this disease elsewhere yeah. and so it's sort of just saying that the, the numbers are being massaged to fit a, a story as opposed to but anyway yeah. the numbers are there and they're certainly <laughs> so, so I guess that's, that's the big reason why we've always said you need to look at these numbers in three parts um, one is the Hubei numbers the second is the rest of China and the third is the rest of the world yep. because that's where you actually get a feel for, for what's going on and just knowing the, the numbers from, from China are just that are tough to believe, but there's some sort of information in it. We're not quite sure exactly what that is. Yep. But so let's jump to the... We will. Uh, and just, just for those um, that are listening in, uh, we're, we're going to be referring a lot to your fantastic compilation of uh, charts that you've put together. And mm. uh, we've got that available and we'll put a link in the uh, in the show notes along with the chart pack today. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it has actually gained a bit of a claim, your your uh, your research that you've been doing in charts r around the world, as it seems. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we've just put, the, put them up live because we figured there's no... We may as well share what we're doing 
we, we update the numbers all the time because we're paying close attention to, to what's been going on and we've been doing it for, for weeks now Yep. because um, we do think this is critical to, to really working out what's going on in the rest of the world. And so, yeah, we've just put those charts up live on our site and, and at nucleuswealth.com you can go and, and find that. Or you can just Google um, them. Or Google them. Top, and, 10, <coughs> top 10 searches for COVID statistics at the moment globally. So, uh, yeah, well yeah. done, Damien. <coughs> so outside of China... Um, so what we're doing here, and just to, just to note that what we've done is said, okay, well, let's look at um, not just have you got the disease outside of China, but did you catch it outside of China? Because at the start, what we had was a lot of people who were, um, most of the cases you got elsewhere were people who just traveled from China to, to somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And so um, what we did is strip that out. So within the data and actually said, well, who are the people who actually caught it within a country? Because that's what we're really trying to find out is, um, and that's something we're sort of seeing very much in the data now is this huge outbreak right across the Middle East, which isn't actually really an outbreak in these countries yet. I think Bahrain might have 30 cases maybe, something like that. Um, but it's not really a, an outbreak in Bahrain. This is just all people who have come from Iran. Mm. And so until we see um, actual cases uh, within that country transferred and picked up naturally, that's where we start to get more concerned. And it's actually not even the first layer that's that's as concerning it's more the second and third order effects because if somebody comes from iran um to bahrain and then infects somebody you know gets off the plane and shakes somebody's hand or or, or pushes a luggage cart and infects somebody straight away there yep that's sort of under that's more understandable and 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 you can sort of see that 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 isn't really a reflection of, of is it transferring within the country than if that person who then has the disease goes elsewhere and then passes it on to his family or something like that that's yep. more of an issue than than, than a direct step and so what we're seeing within that is these cases are doubling basically every four to five days. And that's been pretty consistent mm. since we started. Um, you know, we've seen that uh, you go back three weeks ago, um, it was doubling every five days um, yep. or, 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 or less. Um, you go back two weeks, it was doubling every five days. You go back one week, it was doubling every five days. Right now, it's doubling every four days. Yep. Um, so it, 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 until we actually start seeing that, um, that slow down, um, we'll... we'll yeah, we've, we've got to consider it's going to keep going. Yep. And, and one of the things we have been, um, you know, on this graph on the left-hand one, you can see this big amount blowing out of these um, uh, under investigation where we know it doesn't come from China, but they're actually so busy they haven't actually even worked out where it's from. This is generally South Korea and, and Italy reporting these stats, yep. is that they just haven't had time. They've just got, they're have just they getting hundreds of cases mm. and they're not, they just don't have the time to do the forensic where did you get it from, you know, tracking it through that you see from places like Singapore, which have been really on top of this in terms of they're looking for, they get a detailed case history for everyone who's got it of anyone who's been within two metres of that person um, uh, for for a prolonged period of time. Yep. So they're really trying to get, get on top of what's happening. The problem is once this, gets too big you just you can't do it you just don't have the resources to actually track back through these cases and and that sort of touches on the important point where you know confirmed cases means reliable testing means some form of testing so you know if you're not testing then you can't confirm a case well exactly and and the test rates i mean they they do have false positive a lot of actually sorry false negatives yeah so um which has been a bit of a problem because there's people have been tested and told no you haven't got it and then gone and come back a few days later going look i still feel a bit sick and then they've tested again and gone oh i actually do have it wow and so there's places like Singapore where it's mandatory before they knock them away that they've, they've tested them twice mm. on separate things because and it might not be the it might just be the person who's doing the test hasn't quite you know got the right section or, or done whatever yep and so um, yeah I guess what I'm saying is there's uh, the, the the level we get from different countries is very different and um, places like Iran where there's just been this huge explosion of cases not, not even just within Iran mm. just all the countries around it yep. have all got it and so you know the cases in Iran are way bigger than the, the hundred or so that they're talking about absolutely yep. I mean the the uh, their own health minister has it yeah it's that part where <laughs> well, yeah and it's, like, it's and it's an interesting one um, laugh, but, but, I know, but, but at one stage they had 60 they had when, yeah. when he got it they had 60 cases they were telling everyone we had 60 cases um, six, uh, sorry, about 10 of them were already dead. Mm. Yeah. One of them was the actual health minister. <laughs> yep. And all these other countries around had all these cases coming through as well. So you know it's wrong. And yep. you know there's, you know, run, there is, there is almost definitely a, an outbreak, at least of the size of South Korea, most probably um, Absolutely. moving towards China size. It's an interesting outbreak. one too, actually. Um, so my mother-in-law's Iranian, right? Yeah. Um, and a microbiologist, or ex-microbiologist trained. And um, I was speaking to her last night about what's going on in Iran, and just mm. to sort of say, well, have you got any inside intel, essentially? Mm. Where did it, where do you think it came from? So the city where it's sort of the, the center point is Qom. Yep. 
um, and actually is a renowned uh, religious university hub for the Middle East. And mm. they suspect that there was Chinese people coming in to go to uni at mm. Quam. Mm. Um, that may be the reason why, you know, that, that's mm. the, 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 link, the linking point potentially um, yeah. for that. So that bodes a little bit. That's an interesting case study now for perhaps, um, you know, thoughts for turning it back in but, local shores. But it's obviously, it's <laughs> obviously, been, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's obviously been sitting there for, for weeks. Like mm. it's not, like people don't die of this straight away. That's it right. usually takes at least two or three weeks before you get to the stage where people are dying. Mm. And so the fact you're getting, you know, um, more than a dozen dead there already means uh, it's been there for a long time and that means it's probably spread out in far more cases, far more places than Absolutely. you can possibly track down. Yeah, and you've got you know, lower, lower levels of testing as well, potentially, and yeah, it's mm. caught them up. So. All right. Yep, so the next one uh, is, um, yeah, just sort of going through this world, not, not an afterthought. So we've got the, the rest of China, just sort of comparing and contrasting statistics. So the rest of China data, which we don't really trust, but, you know, anyway, it is, it is what it is, sort of showing this huge jump and then, then down, like they had five cases yesterday. Um, across the whole of China, whereas the rest of the world's now into the um, you know, pretty close to 500 cases yesterday. So um, yeah, there's certainly a very different. Um, yeah, when we get to see more data, it seems that the more we look at other data, the, the less the Chinese data seems to make sense <laughs> in terms of that. And, and and as well, we'll move on as well to to how we think about some of these things going forward. Uh, mortality rates. Um, okay, so, so there's a little bit of misinformation out there on, on mortality rates. Uh, we just want to highlight what we've tended to show. So the first thing is looking at the number of cases from today versus the number of deaths today is not accurate because the problem is somebody who gets just gets tested today hasn't had a chance to die yet. They may mm. well die. You've got them as a case yep. and um, they'll die over the next week or two, but you, you're still counting them as if they haven't died. So you actually have to do this lag and look back. Mm. And when we do that across um, a whole bunch of different places, it looks as if uh, the, the death rate, once it gets out of control, is probably around 5%, mm. uh, maybe higher, uh, in, 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 a, in places where your hospitals get overrun or you're not, you haven't got the same level of medical care. Uh, if you do have high levels of medical care and um, your hospitals aren't overrun, then you're probably below one percent. Could be could be as low as half a percent, uh, but you know it depends upon upon different regions, and, and that's a big difference. You know, you're looking about ten times the number of potentially ten times the number of deaths, mm. and so that's one of the key things to this. And we'll move on to that a little bit later. But one of the key things to this whole thing is making sure your hospitals don't get overrun, mm. and because if if your doctors are getting sick and your nurses are getting sick and and people are turning up. And you don't have enough ventilators, and you don't have the the, the processes. That's where this thing gets you know out of control. Yep. Um, as we've seen in Hubei. Um, and, and so. And I guess the scary thing with that as well that is in um, in Western countries, if you go down the road to get medical care in the hospitals for, what are you going to do? Mm. Just keep driving. <laughs> You're right. going to end up at another hospital, aren't you? Yeah. Um, you know. Whereas in China, they they can just sort of ring fence an entire city. Well, um, in the Western world, not, you'd suggest that people uh, are just going to keep no, climbing. No, badly, they, they can. In, yeah. in, in Italy now, there are armed guards at checkpoints in well, these and. There is a three-year, sorry, not three-year, a three-month prison sentence for um, skipping through one of these checkpoints. Wow. So Italy's yeah. actually got stricter quarantine on it than what China has. Mm. In, in mm. you know, in China, they've in some of these towns they're put on. Like in China, they can leave, uh, you know, once a day or once every couple of days. They're, they're allowed to go out and sort of buy some groceries or do whatever and come back. Yep. You know, one at a time and keeping distance away from other people. But in Italy, it's it's a stricter lockdown with with bigger jail sentences. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is. People say, "Oh no, China is the only place that can do this." They're not. Yeah. You know, okay. Other places can and will do it, and 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 probably should do it. You mm. know, in terms of, um, you know, it sounds bad, and it's a, a restriction of, you know, my, my personal rights and all this type of stuff like that. But um, people's rights don't extend to to spreading viruses to other people, and yeah. so governments will will crack down and, yep. and probably be supported for it. I yep. think, in most countries. Great point. Moving on. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, one of the ch- sorry, one of the charts I didn't put up. I should have forgot about forgot to put this one in. Was just the summer versus winter as well. Mm. So um, that's one where, which I haven't, yeah, you can find that on the website, but we're just looking at countries where there has been submission in a, and, you, and you're currently in summer or you're an equatorial country yep. uh, versus winter. Mm. And there's a, there is a huge difference between the two. So it does look as if um, there's quite strong uh, you know, correlation between the two. Yep. We look at somewhere like, um, now, I don't, I don't completely trust the Vietnamese numbers, but you know, the, all the cases we've seen in Vietnam have been in the north of Vietnam where they do have a summer versus winter. Yep. The south of Vietnam where it's very temperate right throughout the time period, they, they haven't. Mm. You know, Singapore um, is obviously um, tropical and, and has had the most amount of cases for a tropical one, yep. but it hasn't seen the, the same levels of outbreaks we've seen in Japan and South Korea and, and others. So Plus it's a transit hub, so I guess it's probably... you know. 
at a high risk sort of area of anyway. Getting picking up people on the way yeah, through. Yeah, 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 quite possibly. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I think there's. Um, it's too early to, to you know say that's fine, but I think it, it does factor in at least into our thinking of saying, well, does this mean that um, you've got a two or three month run at this, uh, and then you, you probably get a bit of a respite in the northern hemisphere, while the southern hemisphere gets it. But but re- in reality, is there's not too many countries in the southern hemisphere with with significant populations. Yep. And then the the history has been of these ones, unless you've actually come up with a vaccine within the interim, then it probably will come back for the next the next version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, uh, just quick um, comparison with SARS. Yep, flip to David. Hand over to David. Yeah, so this was a, the initial modelling that we started using, what, a month ago, I guess, mm. just to uh, <clears throat> try and encapsulate the economic impact. Uh, basically, you know, it was a very short, sharp shock. All of the sectors you would expect were hit, you know, tourism, transport, um Retail, passenger traffic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and they fell very sharply, but it was contained very quickly, and there was this V-shaped recovery that markets have been trading on for the last few weeks. Um, so that's really the only message you need to take out of that, if you want to. Oh, f- and we've pretty much thrown away the other message is we've pretty much thrown away this model though, because it's, oh, yes, it's so much, it's so much bigger and yeah. so much more. Um, yeah, I was going to get yeah. to that with the next few charts, oh, okay. but okay. Uh, and this more of the same um, SARS, you know, short and sharp. Uh, you know, big stimulus, quick rebound, uh, and, you know, everything's more or less okay. So um, that was the model we started with, <clears throat> and we threw away pretty quickly because it, it looked to us very quickly that it was far more contagious than SARS mm. uh, and was going to spread a lot more widely, so the shutdown was going to have to be more severe. So uh, that's a little bit of potted history, and we'll move on to where we well, are well, now. Well, plus as well on the SARS front, um, China is four times bigger now than what it was Mm. just in terms of size it, it only just entered the world trade um organization and so uh you didn't have the supply chain links yep like the the purchases you had were, were, were quite small and so it was just not the same we're not talking about the same um the same thing mm. okay so damo we've got the capital economics charts in here isn't yes it? yeah they're coming after after this one after this this is our i will keep going i'll, I'll quickly run through those and then we can come back to that Yep. Uh, bear with me. Keep going. Oh, hang on. What's this? This is the wrong doc. Okay. All right. Well, um, so so if you look at a range of real-time charts for China right now, in comparison to that SARS model, it just gets completely blown up. Um, <clears throat> the current uh, quarter in China is going to be negative growth. Uh, the next one's going to struggle to rebound. We've got uh, things like, uh, you know, transport and the people movement, um, traffic and uh, railways, buses, just about everything are still very much stalled. There has been a little bit of a rebound, but very stalled. Uh, Same goes for things like coal consumption. Uh, And perhaps most importantly of all, if you look at the broader movement of of people and migrants uh, across... Um, the you know sort of coast to coast uh, sorry border to border in China you can see that a lot of the migrant workers the, the kind of 300 million or so that go home during the lunar new year a lot of them just simply haven't come back mm-hmm. and so as you would expect if you put yourself in their circumstances uh, we suspect a lot of them have gone home to families and the, and the families have simply said well you can just hang out here until you know we get a much you know, better notion that the the entire epidemic has passed, uh, and so this has led led to enormous labour shortages right across China, uh, and obviously the implication of that is output is severely restricted, and so, you know, our our base case for that is for it to continue far longer than it did with SARS, and for the rebound to be slow and halting, because you'll probably get a few more outbreaks of the virus mm-hmm. as it tries to reopen. Uh, and more importantly, the process of reassuring the Chinese people that they're not going to catch this virus the moment they go back to work is going to take time. Mm, mm. Uh, so those migrant workers, are, you know, the, the government has tried various things already to get them back to work, and some of it's clearly working. There is a bit of an uptick in activity, yep. but it's going to take a long time. There, you know, it's been a big virus, enough dead for everyone to be pretty upset and angry about it. Yep. 
Uh, and so, you so, know... So when you say um, increase in activity, what are you talking about there? What are the metrics? Look, we're starting to see more traffic congestion and whatever in, in, you know, in the major cities. Yep. Um, things like... So, um, so we're basically trying to run this off um, fast-moving data that we can actually see what's happening because yep. the GDP data, um, we're not going to see that for another yeah. you know, month or two. Yep. Well, another month and a half out of, lagging out of, out yeah. of uh, China and another yep. two or so three months. So you get real-time property sales, that kind of thing, uh, coal, coal power output yep. um, or consumption of mm-hmm. coal. Um, all of these things are sort of just slowly trending up. But, you know... We're talking from from a very low base, mm. um, so uh, so basically, you know, this this quarter is a write off. Next quarter is going to be pretty close to a write off. Yep. We think it'll obviously be better, but it'll still be severely inhibited. Uh, and maybe by Q3, we'll start to get something sort of back to normal China. But at the rate that it's going global. Uh, we're going to see a whole sort of second round of impacts globally that are going to come back and rebound on China as well, mm. you know, through its external sector. Uh, and so uh, no V-shaped recovery mm. is what you want to take out of it. Yeah. And the, and the other part is, look, we'd already been speaking quite a bit about how we were seeing companies pull their supply chains out of China already on the back of trade wars and intellectual property and, yep. and all these other issues that we had before. This is just accelerating the whole issue. This has just brought brought it right to the front of everyone's focus. Is saying, do I really want to f- base my whole country's future on whether I have my chi- my Chinese factories working or not? Mm, yeah, absolutely. or do I actually want to develop? Well, that's the, the yeah. longer term takeout, most definitely. Mm. Mm. Over the last decade or so, China went from being you know more of a a um, niche um, supply chain player to actually you know, kind of importing entire supply chains for different industries. Yep. Mm. Uh, and that is no longer viable mm. from a risk management perspective. So there'll be a lot of deglobalization for China ahead. Yep. Mm. Mm. Very yeah. good. Um, this this next chart yeah, is, yeah. this is sort of get, getting into the trade-off between these saving lives and the economic impact. You and spoke a little bit about this on the business last night, Damien. A little bit, yeah. So what I'm trying to highlight here, this is actually from back from the uh, the swine, sorry, the swine flu, the, uh, the Spanish flu yeah. in sort of 1918. And I'll just say that basically this is our new working model for how this will transpire since we've mm. thrown out SARS mm. uh, and uh, the research has thrown up you know, some experiences from the 1980 Spanish flu. Yep. Uh, and this is a very good one, we think, to run with. Yeah. So the first line there shows Philadelphia, um, which sort of basically said, no, everything's fine, guys. Um, don't worry about this. You know, you know, kept everything. Um, they started getting the first cases. They kept everything open for three weeks. And you can just see the, the amount of people um, who died was, was dramatically different to the dotted line, which is St. Louis, where um, they actually banned public gatherings. Within two days of their first couple of cases, they were out banning public gatherings and slowing everything down and stopping the... Um, you know, I think, I think Philadelphia actually had a parade sort of halfway through that, you know, also not halfway through, but sort of, I think maybe the, just before the, it took off, um, they had this big city parade with tens of thousands of people all, you know, marching the streets and kind stuff like that. Kind of like, like an that. Olympics, perhaps. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, which then probably pushed that even further. So, and, and our thoughts are that, um, you know, this is probably not a bad model for seeing what's happening in China. Yep. Um, if you took Wuhan and the Hubei province to be that Philadelphia where you just get this huge blowout in, in the number of people dying, mm. but it actually finishes relatively quickly. So within sort of four to six weeks, you're over that most of the hump and, and you've seen most of the, the worst of it. Yep. Um, whereas when you slow things down, you actually give your hospitals time to, to, to actually treat people. Uh, far fewer people die, but it does mean that it lasts longer. Yep. And so, and this sort of lasted into, in St. Louis sort of lasted into their summer. Mm. Um, oh, sorry. That's, sorry, that's into their winter. That's coming out of the... Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's through, away. Yeah, so, right, yeah. Um, yeah so, so they got it, sorry, at the... Um, yeah, through spring. Throughout their, um, throughout autumn. Yeah. Autumn. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Autumn into winter. Yeah. Yeah. Into winter. winter. Okay. But yeah. So that was. um, Yeah. So. But. But I guess that the 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 story is if you slow it down, it is very very good for your people. Fewer of them die. Mm. But it does mean that the the disease lasts longer within your because you you basically you you basically reaching the view that there are so many people who have it now I can't stop it, Mm. but I can slow it down. Slow the transmission. Slow the transmission down. And if I can slow the transmission down, far fewer people will die because my hospitals can handle it. Yep. 
probably fewer people will get it as well um, and I can get it down to the level where I can actually sort of the disease can, can either go through it's either been through the people who are going to catch it mm. or um, you know I can prevent you know, some, at least some of them but but with a lot of these you just you just cannot prevent um, you know certain number of cases I think as some people some virals virals have explained as you know if we could prevent the flu we would yeah you know? of course so, yeah. yeah absolutely there's one point to make about this chart as well in terms of China is uh uh, if you accept that the spike is Wuhan and the rest of China is St. Louis, mm. like Philadelphia is Wuhan, yep. then uh, you have to ask yourself why the rest of China has no more cases. Mm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, because according to the experience in the Spanish flu, um, if they're going, taking the St. Louis path, uh, they should have it longer. Mm. Mm. Yep. Should be more appearing. Yeah, but just yep. some fewer, fewer numbers eventually. Okay. Um, so the trade-off, I guess, between saving lives yeah. and economic impact. Exactly. So that's exactly the, the thing. The, the, uh, the thing every government now around the world has to has to work out is you put on quarantines, flight bans. You know, you stop everyone from coming in. You will save more lives. Mm. You let as much economic activity go. Um, you know, you but, but but that will affect your economy. Yep. You're, you're going to lose out on that front. And so I guess our, our rough thing is saying, well, somewhere between half and one percent of the pop, of people who catch it will will probably die. Um, if you put all the quarantines on and, 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 and slow things down, uh, if you don't, you're probably talking about 5%, but your economy will look much better until, <laughs> until it finally hits. Yep. So, and possibly come out faster as well at the other side. So, um, you know, it's a decision every, every government's going to have to make. Mm. And our, our expectation is that governments will opt to save lives and to, uh, to, to slow the economy down. And, and that will be the, the, the Sort that out later. Yeah. yeah. And still be, and, and, and and still right, be electable. But, and rightly so. Yeah, yeah of course. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. far, far yeah. easier to explain why, um, you know, growth was slower and not as many people have jobs than, than why so many people died. Yep, absolutely. Except yeah. perhaps Scott Morrison. But Scott we'll Morrison. see. Yeah, yeah, let's hope. But <laughs> and it's interesting. I was just saying from overnight, um, you know, Donald Trump's really tied his um, hoisted his flag on the back of you know we're doing a great job and look we haven't got any cases, which I sort of feel as if um, is he painting himself into a corner a little bit. Well, it's with an election coming up, it's not a good thing to to, to do. I mean, he's already got problems in his his, in his own. Um, so many people have been fired or, or quit from his administration. You know that the the allegations of you're running a shambolic government mm. is is already out there. Yep. Um, if there is a big outbreak in break in the US and you've already tied your thing to I'm running the best government ever, and people turn around and go, well, look at all these factors why you are stuffing it up and why all these people in and out. You know he's he's vulnerable. Yep. Yes. Yep. And so to um, a point though, is he ever really vulnerable to anything? Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, facts, have facts ever gotten in the way of you know, young Don? No, but if, but if my grandmother died, <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. you know, yeah. and especially then, if it rips through the yeah, poor South or something like that, yeah. And, yeah, and, and the interesting da- part with the US now, I haven't, I, don't, I haven't checked the updated data, so updated data from today, but as of two days ago, they'd run about four hundred and thirty tests across the entire of America. Wow! So yeah. they've Australia got sort of, alone's conducted three thousand. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and and South Korea is talking about numbers in the hundreds of thousands as they're, as they're trying to try and work yeah. out where it's going. They've got these really big goals as to how they're going to do it. So. Um, that, that, that could be because a test in the US costs a thousand dollars and it's like free over here, though, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe. But they, they actually sent out the wrong test kits to a bunch of places and they had to withdraw all the test kits. Wow. Then. And so, and they're even still, they're talking about a couple of weeks before they'll get proper test kits out to people. So it hasn't been a, hasn't been run well at all mm. um, in the US. And so vulnerability for, for Trump. But, but it's also the point about saying they've got way more students than, than anyone else. Mm. There's, there's sort of 350,000 odd students in. Uh, Chinese students in in the US, um, and they haven't had travel bans, or they have. They have had travel bans, but they put on the same time. They put them on at the uh, in the start of um, oh, I had them on that chart at the start of February. Okay. So there was enough time though for I mean every other country's had enough time to, to get people in before that. Yep. Uh, you'd have to think there's at least a few there, and so the issue US hasn't reported a lot, but is that because? Um, there is something different about the US or yep. the whatever, or is it just because they're just not running tests? Mm. If yep. you've only run 400 tests, um, there's a limited number you're going to find. Yep. You're no, not going to have hundreds. That's the reason. So, dust, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so the danger Trouble. is in the US, I mean, it might be fine, but the danger in the US is maybe there is already an outbreak. We just don't know about it. Mm. Yep. So, and, and it's a bit like Italy. Like, I mean, Italy is a first world country, pretty good uh, medical systems and all that. Yep. Um, it was definitely it was definitely in Italy for weeks before 
Um, you know, it wasn't until the death started to happen and people were like, let's go and check them. Wow, this person has coronavirus. Let's go check all these mates. Yep. Wow, they've also got it. Let's actually start branching out and finding out all of a sudden we've got hundreds of cases. And the so, US is in winter at the moment as well. So yes, in in factor. Yeah. yes. All right, very good. Uh, the cycle, so looking from an economic standpoint. Yeah. Now this one, um, so so this, this to me is the key for, and this is where we started, uh, part of the reason why we pulled back um, our holdings, even before we'd seen um, a broad spread, we sort of went, well, if a pandemic happens, that's a, at the start we were sort of like, this is, this. This has all the hallmarks of a pandemic, mm. but um, could easily go the other way. So let's, you know, we don't have to, we're not sort of investing on the basis of uh, predicting a pandemic, you know, at the start of it, but we're saying, but we were sort of tracking and saying it has all the hallmarks of a pandemic. And so we really do need to watch it carefully. Yep. The thing that got us though, was saying, um, we, you go through these debt cycles and I've got a chart up here, which is the corporate debt to GDP in the US. And it basically, for anyone just listening, not watching, it basically starts at sort of the high 30% of, of, of GDP and goes up to the, into the 40s and then um, you have this peak and you have a recession and uh, which comes first is the corporate debt. So usually the corporate debt cycle is sort of helping to, to start the recession yep. and then it comes flying back down um, to almost as low as it was before and then it rises again. And so every time we, see, we hit this credit cycle peaks and then it starts falling, it, we're into recession. Yep. Um, and we know this is one of the longest ex- economic expansions we've ever seen. We know corporate debt is actually now at record highs. Yep. And we know something is going to knock this off at some stage and we were positing that you know whether it's it doesn't have to be a global pandemic it can just be this disruption of the supply chains and the, the d- d- disruption of demand coming from chinese tourists right. that can knock this off the um all these high the leverage com- uh, companies that are yeah moments away from uh, bankruptcy and if they don't you know, exactly yeah. and so and these people who have, have got these high levels of debt and now they're sort of and and Yes, fine, I've got all my products, but I've actually got a six-week air gap now because yep. they haven't been producing in China. And so maybe they've started now, but by the time I put it on the boat, I'm actually, I've got to wait six weeks before it comes off the boat. They're the ones we're worried about. Mm. Um, and, and indeed, the market is now worried about them. Yes. In like the last three days, there's been virtually zero high-grade bond issuance yep. in the US and Europe. So, so what <clears> that's <throat> saying is the, high bond, the, the bond market is freezing up. Yep. And the same way as what we saw in the financial crisis, it was it was back to consumer loans and it was different. It was sort of a different type of debt. I mean, there's still corporate debt it had issues, as you can see on this graph. But it was mainly the co- it was mainly the consumer debt that was where it all started, and that sort of started to freeze up, which was what um, you know caused everything to roll over. What we're saying is, this is we're not saying it's it's absolutely going to happen, and and you know you have to it's it's a guaranteed. Yep. But there's a very strong chance of it. Markets are expensive. They're looking for a reason. They're looking for a reason. Yep. Yeah. We we felt we may as well sit on the sideline and, and wait and see. And 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 we're still not, you know, as I said, corporate debt markets are freezing up. Yep. We're certainly not rushing back in and yeah. saying, you know, the markets are down five percent. We've got to get in get in and buy before we because if, if this thing rolls over, then this is the start of the next recession and, and it's not a it's not something central banks are gonna be able to save by by turning the, the printing presses on. And and they've already yeah. You know, None of them have any more ammunition. There is another parallel with the GFC in that the nature of the risk uh, is not precisely the same, but it's kind of analogous analogous mm. um, in the, and central banks can't necessarily do much about it mm. in that uh, it's, it's just, you know, in the GFC you had counterparty risk run through the entire financial system in such a way that nobody knew who was vulnerable. Yep. And so nobody would trade anything. And analogously, it's the same because nobody understands the virus. Nobody mm. understands who's vulnerable. Yep. Or the supply chains. Yep. Or the supply chains. And there's all these companies coming out and just saying, we can't give guidance. If you can tell me what's going to happen with the virus, then I'll tell you my guidance. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so a central bank can't really fix that. It's another form of counterparty risk. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yep. And so, you know, we're going to see the um, higher risk ends of the bond market melt down yep. pretty soon. I think, and, and yields start to rise. Mm. And, and the danger there is um, that what happens is the good companies now, not they're not they're usually not good companies at this end, but there are companies out there that will be thrown out that would have otherwise been fine. Yeah, because they'll be the ones who are, um, you know, they've got this debt expiring, they've got to roll it over, they're paying back what debt to one person and rolling it over to to the next set. It's yep. not it's not like a home loan in 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 um, it, well. In, in, in the consumer parlance, it's like having your home loan every three or four years. You actually have to go and give all the money back, and then go and borrow the money from somebody else. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, and so for these companies, they're giving all the money back and then going to borrow, and and There's no one there. They're just saying, no, that's fine. And they're like, look, everything's fine. Yeah. They're like, well, yeah, but 
we don't know what your supply chain's like. And, yeah. and, and the issue with these supply chains is there's, some of these things have, you know, especially the manufacturers, they might have thousands of parts and you only need a few of those parts to be coming from China and to be locked That's up. Right. And, and Can't sell and, the car. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yep. so yeah, so it's, it's a big, big issue and um, we're far from past. Yep. Yeah. So far, far from into safety. All right. Scary stuff. All right. So uh, cumulative real returns. Yeah. The war Actually, was this, was, well, just, this was a comment we were making before saying, look, markets do generally go up. You generally, yep. do, you know, there's a, there's a whole, there's a stock trade in, in turning up on, um, you know, whenever these things happen and just saying, hey, calm down, everyone. These things happen. Um, this is by the opportunity, by the dip opportunity, you, everything will be fine. Um, you know, markets generally go up and they're, yep. they're right you recover but you do go through periods where um you know it took 10 years to recover from the uh, uh from yeah you've the, got to be singing that song for a long time exactly <laughs> you can go through you can go through very long periods before you get your money back and so and we think this we're not absolutely positive this is one of those cases but yep. we know that markets are expensive and we know there's enough risks there that we think you should just be sitting on the sideline and say look let's just wait if yep. i miss out on the chances on, on a little bit of a, a bounce that's fine because the downside risk at the moment is is much higher than the, the yeah we've well, got the a, potential for upside. Got to weigh the evidence, haven't you? And then and then uh, act yeah. appropriately. And the, and the other thing I'd say as well, we've only got equities dead and, and bank deposits here. I would say um, you want liquid assets right now. Mm. You do not want to be owning um, corporate bonds and other factors that, that uh, other types of uh, unlisted assets that just don't sell very often that, because yeah, can lock up. Yeah. Exactly. You, you, you. The chance of you getting locked up into that fund if it goes into if things do get worse yep. is high. Mm-hmm. And um, and the other one that fits into that category is a house. Uh, mm. If you own a house, um, that is an illiquid asset. You cannot turn around tomorrow and sell it. Yep. Uh, well, sorry, you can turn around and sell it, but you, you cannot turn around and get money for it tomorrow. Mm. Um, you know, even if you do sell it, you might have to sell it again in a few months' time when the person doesn't come through. And you know, there's all those other factors. So, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, right now, our um, our expectation, certainly within our portfolios, everything we're doing is liquid assets, liquid assets, liquid assets, because. If you do want to switch back, and or, or you do get some sudden, massive, unheard, ever, unheard of, ever huge stimulus, then yep. um, you can switch back in. But if you're holding these illiquid assets, you just you you're stuck. You're stuck. What yep. you own is what you own. Yeah, fantastic point, Dave. Excellent. Okay, the Australian fallout. Who'd like to begin, David? <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, this is pretty much an old story now, but tourism and students is the pointy end of it. Uh, we don't make much anymore these days, so we're not really in the supply chain hit. Uh, more in the services end, and uh, so this damage is unfolding really before our eyes. The student damage is already done. We saw uh, Flight Centre out today with an immense profit warning. Mm. It was guidance was kind of amusing. <laughs> it said, you know, after SARS there was a V-shaped recovery, so we'll be fine in the second half, but anyway, we'll see on that. Um, so tourism has been belted. The students uh, don't have to be here yet. Their final deadline is approaching in the next week or two. Mm. Uh, but clearly they would, a lot of them would already be here if it weren't for the travel ban. Uh, the government keeps torturing our elderly with uh, you know, teasers of whether they're going to drop that ban and bring the students in. Mm. Uh, and I just want to highlight as well, <coughs> it's, it's, it's macabre that, that we've got a government who's talking about relaxing just as every other country's tightening up, up. Yep. tightening up and yep. saying just a minute we don't know where this is all coming from let's yep. let's tighten up our borders and we're talking about saying which we actually did move quite quickly way way, way faster than what i thought yeah so there was actually a very good move in terms of that whole let's lock down the travel and and cool. do the quarantine look I, I don't know what's going on with it i, I honestly think it's political suicide mm. um, which you know politicians aren't renowned for um, but the australian universities have been lobbying very hard and have reached levels of irresponsibility that are quite, kind of difficult to fathom for public institutions. Well, I don't know. They're going to need bailouts. Well, I was going to say, well, they're gambling with look, their, so- their own solvency, though, really, aren't they? Well, they'll need bailouts. Give yeah. them the bailouts. Mm. You know, and, you know, the government, on the other hand, is, is busy saying we don't have any money to give anyone. Mm. Like, they've got it completely backwards. You, you shut the border and you open the fiscal pipe. Yep. You know, and of course they can afford it. 
uh, you know, in this age of QE, you can afford pretty much anything. But and even without it, QE, even we've, without got one QE of the least, we've got one of the least geared governments in the yes, world. Yes, we do. Yeah. And they're obsessed mm. with the surplus, etc. And it all comes back to supporting banks and house prices and what have you. But mm. um, and, it's, and it's not like universities aren't profitable or anything. I'm pretty sure if you lent them a block of dough, you'll, you'll get it back at some point. So. Yeah, look, <laughs> it's fine. You know, that's what should happen. If it, if it doesn't happen... Uh, I think that the government is is literally committing suicide. Mm. I mean, all you'll have to do at the next election is whisper bushfires and virus, and yep. everyone will, will pull out a revolver. Yeah, I'd say that for the um, next couple of decades. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It, 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 you know, if if you end up unleashing the virus through drop in in a quick way, in going back to our Philadelphia Philadelphia versus St Louis model, mm. and you make Australia Philadelphia uh, with five percent mortality rate when it could have been one. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yep. I, I don't know where to even look, to be honest. So anyway, we've got the students hit. It'll probably continue. Let's assume they're sane enough. Uh, even if the students come in, I don't think it matters a great deal um, because, uh, you know, obviously, as this thing gets worse and worse, um, I think the consumer will bunker some more. It's all, you know, she's already very, uh, very cautious. Uh, I think that's likely to intensify. Uh, and we've also got, you know, data out now that suggests we might have been in, already in recession in Q4 last year. We're certainly going to be in recession in Q1, so there's going to be a lot of negative data flow. Uh, you know, we're going to get an unemployment spike of some magnitude. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, all, all of those things will have kind of um, self-fulfilling or self-feeding dynamics. Uh, and then, you know, going out probably into Q2, we're into probably, I think, a bulk commodity price hit. Um, they've all held up so far, largely, I think, because logistics have been so heavily disrupted in China. So it's been difficult to get iron ore and, and coking coal and thermal coal into China. So the Mongolian border shut, for instance, which meant that a lot of the more local production of these commodities was unavailable. Mm-hmm. And so we've had a bit of a bid in them for the last few weeks. But if, you know... And as well, there's been this whole... Um, there's been very much a market narrative is that central banks are going to come out, and particularly the Chinese central bank is going to yeah. come out the biggest stimulus package you've yes, ever seen. that's part of it. And, yeah, yeah they're going to build. So, uh, but there's at the same time... There's a lot of lag in that as well, if, though, isn't there? There's, there's a lot of lag in that as well, though. Like, you're really looking over some, the... Some the lag, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know... While, while the commodities have not been terribly available, um, the steel mills have never shut down. They've been running out steel like crazy, and the end user demand has collapsed, of course, because the, co- the economy's basically sitting stalled. At, sitting at home. Sitting at home. And so there are these immense piles of steel inventories just everywhere. They're record, record highs across the board, still growing. And so the steel mills are going to have to ratchet back mm. uh, their output, and uh, you know that's going to start hitting these... Bulk all commodity ends. prices so yeah. that comes in and lands on the budget and national income and all these all the rest um the the sort of risk case nightmare scenario is that look the the likelihood is the virus is going to come here um because really you can't shut everybody out in mm. the end you can slow it down but it'll probably get here and if it is winter based as it appears to be it's going to arrive into our autumn winter mm. Uh, and we may have all of these uh, most severe effects in our economy at the same time that that the virus actually outbreaks here or breaks out here and you know the government's forced into some of the draconian measures that we're seeing elsewhere Mm. Um, depending on how severe any outbreak was of course Uh, but you can imagine if they do let some students in and you get a little bit of an you know, a dozen kids, not much more at one campus. Yep. The entire system shuts down. Yep. This is the craziness of doing it in the first place. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, uh, in effect, you've got a very weak economy hit by a very nasty shock. Um, a government that's refusing to mitigate that shock in both fiscally and physically. Uh, and so this all comes back to the RBA. <laughs> um like everybody thinks they're going to cut in April, I can't see why they wouldn't cut next week. Mm. Um, all of this is is as plain as day. Mm. Uh, and, and if debt markets stay frozen, we're we're almost positive they will. Yeah, 
Um, sorry, or if you have Mark's praise, we're almost positive that RBA will cut. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we're not I mean, this, we're... Is, this is a very fast-moving feast, right? So, as Damo says, if, if we don't see any new bond issuance in global markets over the next four or five days, the RBA will cut. Mm. Um, well, not even four or five, we've got three, three days. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, there has to be a high risk that the RBA, RBA works this out. You know, it's it's not a risk anymore, yeah. right? This is a real shock. Yep. Uh, and so they they need to get to QE as quickly as they can, mm. um, is my view on this, because the way that these risks are kind of piling one atop the other, we could very easily see, you know, credit market freeze lifting interest rates for the banks really fast. Mm. Uh, and they need to be able to offset that. You know, the government guarantee is going to be useless. Yep. Uh, they need to be able to offset any any kind of funding shock for the banks with QE quickly. Yep. Um, so uh, I don't know whether they'll cut. I mean, I'm, I don't know, but there's a there's a very strong case for it in my view. If they don't, then it'll it'll they'll be maybe forced to go mid meeting, mm. uh, and they're certainly going to go in April. As a, that's a certainty. Yep. Um, and I would suggest if they do, they'd be going straight again in May, and then QE in the second half. Yep. I mean. Like, there's just rolling shocks through this. Great time for term deposit holders, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're not front of mind right now. No. Speaking of investment, so investment implications. Uh, we might just, we've got a laundry list here of corporate debt market, consumers, yeah. companies, central banks, and governments. So, well, what are the reactions just, we're predicting here? Look, I just wanted to, to point out that. What the biggest uncertainty is what they call reflexivity is saying just because you think something's going to happen, um, so you don't know what the next step is, yep. and so and what other people's reactions are. And so the the, the four, oh, sorry, the five big things we really don't know how they're going to react is first is this corporate debt market. Will it stay frozen and, and locked up? And, and we think it's going to, we think certainly rates are going to jump significantly, and there's going to be significantly less lending in that. And it's quite possible that this could be our. Yeah, end of cycle event the corporate debt market so that's that's the key one we're watching sure. yep. uh, consumers is the next one so uh, our take is that if you haven't really been affected in an economy so say like Australia mm. then consumers are pretty fine yeah if it passed and, and Australia have got it then consumers, they're off and running again yep. uh, at the point where they're starting to get locked down and quarantined I think that's the <laughs> point where consumers are, are going to be sitting on their hands. So I think in China um, is a good example of that. Mm. I think your first step after you've been locked up in your apartment for three weeks is not to rush out and buy a new car and a new Louis Vuitton handbag. No, that's right. I think there's yeah. more, people will be a lot more cautious in terms of what they're doing and just that whole sense of um, you know, slowing down. Uh, that's that's going through uh, other countries now, South Korea, potentially Japan is, is getting close to that point as well. Um, they haven't started any of those lockdowns yet, but you know Japan could be easily there. Uh, Italy is yep. is there, um, so we do think there's a there's a there's going to be a flow through from consumers. And, and there's just a note on that as well. Um, you're sort of reading more and more about how people are having their pays frozen, um, using up leave. Um, those sort of things sound like it's sort of becoming a lot more prevalent through China. Um, and I guess yeah. that reflecting that back on um, the fact that most. Most people seem to only be able to be able to survive maybe one to two months with available cash flow, uh, x you know, an income. Mm. Um, you know, if you hold up in home, then obviously you're uh, you're probably not going to be spending much if your income's <laughs> been suspended. Casual workers, for example, if you're you know yes. if you're in a quarantine situation. Yep, um, absolutely. Well, you you'll definitely be saving more in the future, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, companies, the whole supply chain. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on with that, and and it's day to day. I think you know, I think one of the things I wanted to highlight with the companies is, uh, it's interesting to, for me to see how good the companies are at what's going on in their supply chain. So mm-hmm. there's some people who come out quite early in terms of we've got problems, and there's other ones that as time goes on they're like, oh, actually we do have a problem with that. Yep. And so um, and, and you don't know what the second order effects are. Like you, your supplier might be based in Australia and his supplier is based in Australia, but that, that guy's supplier is based in China. Yep. And so um, there's all these second and third order effects that companies just don't know about. And given um, you know a boat from China takes three weeks or, or, or longer from, from to most countries, and you know the US even a bit longer again. Yep. Uh, the effects of, of shutdowns are really only just starting to be felt, and it's and as companies are running out. So we saw in in Korea, for example, um, a little while ago, uh, Hyundai shut down its um, production because it didn't have the the parts it needed to, yep. to do it. And so that's where um, you know, what's happening in companies will make a, a big difference. Uh, and what they're doing with the debt. 
Central banks is the next one. Actually, I might, I'll pump that one to you, David. You haven't said anything for a while. Give me a chance to break. Uh, yeah, well, they're all going to ease, aren't they? Mm. And it's a question about how quickly and, and will they be on the front foot? And is, is it enough? And do they, do they buy corporate debt? Some of these guys? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if it gets bad, obviously, if the credit market freeze continues, you know, our... our um, uh, one of the key lessons you will we'll get from the GFC is is that central banks, you know, will innovate uh, and start to do, you know, whatever it takes. Mm. So there are obviously various central banks around the world that are already buying corporate debt, uh, and so we could see that kind of thing spread. Um, Hong, well, Hong Kong will is... Will they buy a high-risk corporate debt? That's the one where... I mean, that's where you really well, get you, some moral you, hazard. You've you know? got, you got to draw the line somewhere. You'd, you'd, like, to, you'd like to think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, I guess the thing is, when it's a virus like this, everybody can put their hand up and say, look, we're, you know, we're a victim here. Yeah. You know, this is Mother Nature. We didn't do anything wrong. Mm. And, and so the claim on support is sort of morally a bit stronger <laughs> than if, you, if you're over-leveraged and you know just just got just, the cycle wrong yeah, yeah, yeah that said risk has been massively mispriced into this accident so that that as you pointed out in your corporate debt chart that that excuse only washes so much something already always disrupts it yeah and and so hong kong, you, you sort of the hong kong government's guaranteed mm, um two million hong kong dollars yeah, so that'd be high risk corporate bonds. Oh, sorry, that's that's all small corp, small. That's small businesses mainly. So it's, yeah. yeah, which are higher higher risk, but yeah, small businesses. Uh, so what's this like? So, so like an emergency liquidity thing they put out for small businesses? Basically, yes. Yeah, right. Interesting. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of that. And, I they, mean, and they're giving ten thousand dollars to every Hong Kong citizen. Oh wow, ten thousand Hong, Hong Kong dollars. Hong Kong yeah. dollars. Okay, so yeah. Oh, um, wow. But I think they've issued, issued, they'll probably issue that as government debt. I don't think that's helicopter money yet. But yeah, we might see some helicopter money. Who knows? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, but yes, we're going to see central bank innovation, no doubt. Uh, and sensible governments will be spending uh, aggressively yep. through this. Uh, alas, we don't have one of them, but mm. they will be. Um, as, as mentioned, though, the question becomes, you know, can they... Can they make a difference? Um, certainly governments can with a big fiscal push. Um, central banks, uh, you know, phew, I mean, uh, you know, the reason we had such mispriced risk was the central banks were so aggressive already. Uh, and as we've already discussed, you know, the virus uh, impact on business is such that it's kind of a bit like counterparty risk for you know for which central banks really can't do anything mm. um you know you've got to restore trust somehow rather than just liquidity yep because you're facing all these potential insolvencies yep. so they can support but i'm not sure they can cure it in much the same way as you know transpired in the gfc mm. and, and uh, i think you need government anyway to start uh when they start guaranteeing loans and so we saw yeah. in the u.s look um, we'll see a lot of that i think yeah we saw in the u.s um with the big car makers they stepped in and, and you know took over the the, the loans and and yep. yeah because they, they just wouldn't just wouldn't underwrote get it everything underwrote sort of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah so um and effectively the aussie banks as well underwrote the yep. aussie banks yep. too so um that's the type of thing which is not really central banks so it ends up back in the government mm. and the governments don't tend to be that fast to do these things um and as we saw again in the financial crisis you know that the, the all of the uh the initial round went to uh and got knocked back and then the stock market fell i can't remember 10 percent, 15 percent fell a huge amount the next day and then they sent it back and they got signed the next day type of thing so there is <laughs> some of these where governments will um they're not going to be the Whereas a central bank might go, there's a, there's a shutdown in this area, I really need to pump liquidity in there. We're deciding today and we're doing it this afternoon. Yep. Um, governments tend to be, really have to be pushed and dragged and, and you know, they need to set up all the legislation and then we need to convince everyone. And you know, there's, right. there's, yeah. it's not a fast, and, and the, the type <clears throat> of spending as well is not, um, right, tomorrow we're rushing out and, and building all this extra stuff. It's like, well, tomorrow we'll set out some RFPs and yeah. you know, within a few months we'll get them all back and go we'll spec it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll go to tender. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So they're not the types of um, yeah quick spends and, unless you are actually doing cash flash type things, which, which we've seen the Hong Kong government already do. Yep. So I, it's probably worth mentioning as well that it's a different world than it was in 2007. 
like it's much more adversarial you, you're not going to have a, a kind of a happy clappy g20 meeting where everyone commits to spending one or two percent of gdp fiscally mm. you know they'll come together and and uh, you know put a gun to each other's heads probably well, but, but so, even within, within countries though as well you're going to have people go i mean it's it's, it seems there's certainly parties who are not in power who are more than willing to say let let the party in power take a big economic Black. thing and say no yeah. no no this is this is so perfidious and you know you, we can't afford it and you know it's all these things like that just to mm. drive that the economy said, down so they can get voted in next time because everyone hates the the, the end. That it's, a much, said, it's a much that, more fractured world so you're going to get more fractured support. Yeah, well, and I was going to say that being said, that party's currently in at the moment, so I suppose they're, gonna, <laughs> they're probably going to have to spend. Anyway, we're a bit of an interest of time. We'll just quickly roll through the um, the final one and, and the most important part. So investment implications. Yes. How are we using these things, Damien, in, in our investment this, portfolio? This is what we put up the first the first time. Uh, bonds bid, Aussie dollar down, commodities down, stocks down. That was our, our list of four things. Four for four. And so, yeah, so as at the last time we ran this, we had three out of four and the stocks had been holding up and, and the others had done. And, and so now they've come, they've come through. Um, uh, despite that, it's not, um, we're not calling a victory. And I think we think it's, uh, I think there's still more to run and, and the risks are still, um, the risks are growing. Yep. They're not shrinking. Like it's, it's a, um, like this virus has doubled every five days for outside of China. Transmission outside of China doubled every five days for the last month, yep. and it's still doubling. And so, until we actually see that start to slow down, um, caution, yeah, caution, 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 caution. And yep. now we're seeing the debt market freeze up. Um, you know, if that doesn't get unclogged, if we don't see central banks and governments starting to step in, then there's more downside risk. Yep. When we do, we'll have to be assessing. You know, is this big enough to turn this around or not? And the past experience has been um, they don't go big enough. At the start, yep, and then things get worse, and then they decide to go big enough, yep. and so um, yeah, we just really do need to judge this on a day by day basis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, the <clears throat> the thing that's triggering it all can just keep growing. Mm. Mm. You know, I mean, if it, if it were a financial contagion of some sort, then an entree of the central bank could make a very big difference. Mm. If it's not a you know a sort of epochal shock mm. or big end of cycle event. But when the virus can just, you know, the Fed comes out and says we're going to cut and the market rallies and then the virus doubles over the next four days and everyone's like, well, so what? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so we, um, we switched a lot of our stuff, at, you know, a month ago. Some of the bigger names we hold, things like Gilead, which is sort of one of the names out there developing a, well, trying to develop a vaccine for it. And, and actually, just to say on those vaccines, um, there's no miracle cure coming. Like, mm. uh, there, there will likely be vaccines. There's, a, there's enough human intellectual capital pushed at this now, there will likely be vaccines. And, and they'll be pushed out much faster than you expect, but yep. you're talking months before yep. you get there. Um, because, uh, and you know, as I was saying uh, last night, is that you know, we've got this problem in the world of these anti-vaxxers out there who won't take vac vaccinations for diseases that have been around for decades. Yep. And we want to come up with a cure for this and rush it out within the next 20 minutes and give it to the whole population. And they assume that they're going to accept it. And assume they're going to accept it. <laughs> You're gonna if you get it wrong, you've just lost, you yeah, know, you've lost now the faith in that whole system and your measles and all these. Like you've just grown the anti-vaxxers ranks by yeah. uh, you know, exponentially. So yep. they do need to do this properly, and they do need to make sure they've done the proper tests and all that type of stuff to get it through. Yep. Um, but those types of names, those um, uh, the the uh, consumer staples, you know, we cleared out of all our um, oil stocks and travel stocks and all those types of ones. Um, names like Essity, which is one of the um, Probably has some supply chain issues, but they're, they're one of the biggest, world's biggest manufacturers of, of um, hygienic products and yep. all the you know, your hand um, sanitizers and all your, your stuff that goes into hospitals. Clorox, which is a huge um, uh, US uh, of disinfectants and huge US manufacturer and, and seller of disinfectants, and, and it's those types of companies where we're saying, okay, we think there's a little bit of safety in those, um, and certainly um, defensiveness right across the board. Yep. Uh, what we're really trying to do within the stocks ourselves at the moment, so we, we um, sold out heaps. Actually, our next chart's got a, you know, we're sort of our current settings for the various portfolios there for the yeah, data Yeah, so we're we're basically fifty percent um, ish underweight. Actually, that's, and that's not the updated chart either. You've got the old one in there. Oh. Um, anyway, skip, skip that one. Okay. Um, we're about fifty percent underweight the um, 
the equities. We'll put the right. We'll put the right one up on the, on yeah, the, on the, the in the, the show notes. Yeah, sure. uh, but we're basically fifty percent underweight equities on the in our growth portfolios. Our growth portfolio is actually up over the last month so far. So so equity markets are down um, whatever five six percent yep. from, from their peaks. Um, our, our portfolio so far are up just because we have taken that sort of defensive nature and, and tried to be in the bonds and, and international currencies. Um, and so we sort of feel that's that's been relatively. We've certainly been happy with that position so far, um, but. Going forward, what we're what we're more interested in is is sort of pretty much holding that position and trading up in value in our in our stock portfolio. So as as these things happen, you will see stocks smashed uh, much lower. Yep. Uh, as they come out and do their profit warnings, and it's a relative bet between now saying, you know, here's, here's stock A which produces uh, same good as stock B. Stock A just came out with a profit warning and got smashed. We own stock B. Okay, we don't think there's a lot of difference between the two. Maybe we sell B and buy A. Yep. Um, just to sort of keep trading up the of the quality or, or the value within our portfolio over this time frame, but you know we're, we're very much um, in terms of the actual overall. You know we're certainly not looking to to, to buy yet. Yep. We sort of feel there's there's still enough risks around that um, you know, discretion is the, the better part of valor. Okay, very good. Well, on that note, thanks, gentlemen, for um, an important update on a huge crisis, probably the biggest thing hopefully for 2020, and uh, we'll look forward to the next one. Well, that's it for now and thanks for watching. If you like what you heard today and you'd like to hear more, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash subscribe. Give us your email address and in return, we'll send you a weekly email with new webinar topics, links for our podcasts and other news from Nucleus Wealth. I certainly hope you've got something out of today as I have and we'll look forward to catching you with the next one. Cheers.